Amishi, we started out with why now? And the topic for you is, but science says so. <laughs> so one thing I just wanted to say is, you know, we're obviously doing a, a kind of a round robin snapshot of a lot of things. A lot of it's to prime the pump in your own minds, which I can feel it in the room. Is like, but what about this and that? I can, I thought <laughs> bubbles are popping up in, in <laughs> heads. I see them from the stage. So just know that this is why we want to have spend a lot of time um, talking after we kind of have lay out some of the main themes that we're seeing as issues with regard to this topic of mainstreaming mindfulness. Is that okay with everybody? Thought bubbles happening? Okay. So in terms of science, um, yeah, I thought it would be helpful maybe to just, similar to what Sharon was saying, come from where I'm at and, and really checking in with my, my background and my uh, intentions and my, my role in this uh, work. And I guess, you know, just to, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet or haven't come across any of the work that we've been doing, I'm a, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. So the work in my lab is interested specifically in the brain's attention system, how it is that it functions, uh, how it's organized, and we use a variety of techniques, you know, cognitive neuroscience techniques, brain imaging, EEG recordings, and behavioral tasks. And my work pivoted toward kind of a, a different way of, of exploring this topic. It wasn't so much only around um, how it works, but what happens when the whole functioning of this very important brain system shifts? when it d is degraded? Hmm. And what are the ways in which it becomes vulnerable? Things like threat, fear, stress, poor mood. And if that's the case, if we see that we can kind of characterize when it is that attention starts falling apart, how might we be able to help? Are there training tools that we can offer to help um, bolster it? And that's where the mindfulness uh, training came into the work in my own lab. So just that's where I'm coming from. And, and, um, you know, a lot of times when I, when I and it relates to the, the question of science, and I, in some sense, because of my background in the work that I do, even though it's, of course, siloed, like a lot of scientists, all of us scientists, I mean, we, we know a lot about very, very, very little, um, very little. Um, I'm asked to, in some sense, represent what's going on in this field. And I've been asked by many leaders in, in communities that I'm interested in working with because they have, because the nature of what they do, they face threat, poor mood, high demand, high stress, which makes them vulnerable to degrading their attention to the point at which what they used to be able to do well, they may not do so well under the circumstances. And that's quite problematic because that's when they need their attention the most. So these are high stress groups. These are students, um, these are military service members and military spouses, these are athletes, uh, corporate people in the business context. We worked with a group of um, uh, accountants before tax season because they knew that was going to be their high stress interval. So, and when I do this, when, I, when I'm able to, to connect with and partner with these, these types of groups, I have to speak to the leadership about, please take a, in our grant funded research project, right? So they ask a pretty straightforward question when I approach them, which is, okay, nice to meet you. <laughs> Does this thing work? Like, what you want me to spend a minute of time with my community, my, my employees or my, uh, you know, people I'm charged with uh, supporting, does this thing work? And I think it's a pretty fair question. And those of you that are working in applied settings, I'm sure have come across this of, you know, is it worthwhile to even begin attempting to work in this context? And, you know, I could just fast track it and say, yeah, of course it works. You know, when can I set up my protocol, you know, to work with you? But I think it's a really important question. And I think that um, we have a responsibility to probe this question ourselves. Because that's where the science has an interface with, with the question, right? So, first of all, what do we mean by it? Does it work? It is a pretty broad thing in and of itself. We can now have people download an app, read a book, go to a YouTube channel, um, take an MBSR class, an MBCT class, go on retreat. There's a world of options. So even when somebody asks if it works, I have to begin by saying, well, there's many things you could do, so we need to know what we're talking about. And then the question is, what does it mean to work? And from my point of view, it really is around, going back to Susan's point regarding intention, 
Is what we're offering going to help reduce suffering? And that suffering can come in many forms. It can be suffering in the body, right? Different physical ailments. It can be suffering in the mind with psychological disorders and suffering in relationships. And what I've seen come about through our field of contemplative science and contemplative neuroscience is that the work we're doing kind of falls under one of those three areas where we're looking to see the impact of our mindfulness training program, for example, and its impact on physical symptoms or psychological symptoms or, or the nature of relationships. And I think the, the news is starting to be quite good, right? We've got meta-analyses now. I mean, we've seen this meteoric rise in the number of publications. Um, we're now probably at about between five and 10,000. I think maybe that's an estimate. And we are at the point where we can now call the, the literature and actually say, okay, yeah, look, there, there's something going on here. If we look at a meta-analysis with 115 papers, looking at randomized control designs, it looks to be the case that there are some things that are better because people take a mindfulness-based stress reduction course or an MBCT course relative to doing something else or a waitlist group. Same thing with the brain data. We now can do meta-analyses of brain imaging structural data, functional data, and that also looks quite promising. And so that's, that's the good stuff. You know, that, at that point, you might say, yeah, look, it's good. But my job as a scientist, first and foremost, is not to just be a cheerleader for an enterprise, but to really help all of us, including the communities I'm interfacing with and the leadership I'm trying to convince to take me in, me in as their project, to be responsible consumers of information. So that they're not just, you know, it's, it's part of the nature of how we want to function as a society. We want smart people making good choices. And so when I uh, even say these things of what we know, I'm also careful to say, and look, there are other concerns that are emerging. M and you probably many of you know about the whole positivity bias problem with mindfulness research, where there's a disproportionate numbers of, number of studies that are suggesting benefits relative to typically seen in any new treatment context. So we have to go really think about that, right? So, so any, any comment to the question, any answer to the question, does it work, shouldn't just be yes, but a really highly provisional yes. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done, and I encourage you all, since I have my two minutes to speak right now, to say, if you have data that has null results, no effects, or negative effects, please publish it. It will help us all. Because again, this is not about some confirmation of what we already know. The Dharma is the truth, and we're just out to just make sure that we're, we're endorsing it with our work. We are, you know, in, as a scientist, I'll say I'm a scientist first and foremost, and my job is to figure out what's going on, what the, the nature of the truth of the way the world works is. So that's where I'm at with regard to science. I think that we have come far. There's a lot of good work doing, uh, we're doing, and I think this conference gives me so much hope of the level of rigor increasing in our collective efforts in the dialogue and the elevation of the conversation we're having with regard to specificity of mechanisms. Hmm. And there's, a, a, there's continued work to be done. So I've probably spoken for way too long, but those yes. are my thoughts.